when things are when things are all copacetic, things are all calm, or I go out in the morning and that before I start doing my chores and they're standing by the barn, the light, if you've looked at my photograph, you've seen that barn light coming in and they're standing there. It's like, thank you. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. It's a gift. So it's a gift. Yeah. It's like, thank you. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 393 of F-Stop, Collaborate, and Listen with your host, Matt Payne. This week, we're doing something a little bit different. I had a fun chat with photographer and shepherdess Nina Fuller. Nina has been making photographs for over 50 years, and through some fairly random occurrences, she found her niche photographing sheep in a fine art aesthetic. The photographs that she creates are beautiful, evocative, and timeless. We discuss her journey as a photographer, along with tons of other fun subjects that intersect. I know that you'll enjoy it. This week's episode is brought to you by Nature Photographers Network and Nature Vision Magazine. NPN is still my favorite hangout for nature photography. It is a community of like-minded photographers ranging in experience level from beginner all the way to full-time professional. My favorite aspect of NPN is looking at all of the great photography that's submitted there and learning from everyone's honest and thoughtful critiques. Even if you don't submit your own work for critique, you can gain valuable insights by reading those critiques. For just $49 per year, you can join the community on NPN and gain access to the critique forums, as well as other amazing benefits, including fantastic articles, webinars, discounted tutorials, software, books, and a lot more. Just today, they did an AMA or Ask Me Anything of Cole Thompson, one of our previous guests here on the podcast. On top of that, NPN has created a fantastic magazine called Nature Vision. I personally look forward to reading every single issue that comes out. It's full of amazing articles and an incredible photography. Got to check it out. If you're interested in NPN or Nature Vision magazine, just head over to npn.link forward slash f-stop. That's npn.link forward slash f-stop. Be sure to use the code f-stop10 for a 10% discount. Cheers. Okay, let's get to this week's conversation with Nina Fuller. All right. Nina Fuller, it's great to have you on the podcast. It's great to be here, Matt. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, it's great to see your smiling face. And one of our listeners and someone who did a workshop with me last year, Jean Fain, is the person that connected us, and I'm so happy that she did. Yeah, she's been here, actually. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, yeah just a really cool person. So anyone that's really cool like that and they say, you should check this person out, I listen. Well, I'm glad she did. Yeah, me too. Well, Nina, for people who aren't familiar with you and your photography, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. My name is Nina Fuller. I'm a shepherdist and a photographer. I've been a shepherdist for 13 years, but I've been a photographer for over 50. And I have a farm in Hollis, Maine, where I raise sheep and I photograph my sheep. I've done a lot of things. Uh, I've always been a professional photographer, so I've done a lot of different jobs. But lately, I just photographed the sheep. You know how people say, you're a photographer, Matt, so you know people go, oh, what kind of photographs do you do? Well, you, you're a landscape photographer, so you say, I'm a landscape photographer. But I, I was doing so many things that it was hard to have describe. I hated that question. It's like, yeah, I just take pictures. And so now it's like, people say, oh, what? what what kind of, what do you do? What kind of photographer? And I go, I photograph sheep. And that just pretty much stops the conversation. Now they're like, wow, what? that's weird. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> I did a podcast with Beth Bulo and we talked about labels. And I think there's a certain freedom in just getting rid of like what you call yourself. I take pictures. I think that's completely acceptable. Yeah. 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 Yeah, people want to know, you know, I don't know, maybe they're just making small talk, but they, you know, want to know details. <laughs> well, I, th I think it's part of human nature to want to try to, like, 
classify things and put things into neat organized buckets and you know when it comes to art and photography especially now with ai and all of that stuff it's really really difficult to organize yourself in in those ways yeah so photograph sheep <laughs> well unlike other people who have asked you about that i am actually very curious to hear more about what that's <laughs> like so you know your photography is i would say about as niche as it gets right you you photograph sheep and it's it's beautiful like if people haven't seen your photography they should definitely go check it out and of course if you're watching on youtube you can see us um, showcase some of your awesome images there but tell us how you came into photographing sheep and uh, the other kind of farm scenes that you that you photograph and i would say i would call it like a fine art interpretation but i'd love to hear how you got into that yeah i definitely um make art out of um the sheep i you know it wasn't like I got, I thought, oh, I think I'll photograph sheep. That would be cool to have a niche. You know, I've never really had it, just a little that, and uh, I'll go get some sheep and do, no, that's not the way at all, the way that happened. I just, I used to photograph a lot of horses. I have horses. And I used to go on a lot of equestrian vacations and photograph the horses on the vacations, photograph on the back of the horse. And this is back in film. And and then in digital, I was still doing it. But, you know, a lot of people do that now with their phones. They're riding along and they, you know, and they can do this. But I had all this heavy equipment. I mean, I used to even carry my 70 to 200, 2.8 <laughs> on the horse. So I had horses and I was boarding them somewhere. And so I, um, that was costing too much. So I bought this farm in Hollis. I sold my house in town and I bought this farm 20 years ago. And Somebody wanted to raise sheep. It was somebody who was, I didn't really know. They knew somebody I knew, and they wanted a place to put the sheep. And I kept saying, no, are you kidding? I don't know anything about sheep. You know, I don't want any sheep. Sheep? I'm like, what? Well, you know? And then, so that went on for a few years. And then finally, this person said to me, oh, this farmer's getting divorced, and he has these 12 sheep. And so this guy wants to buy the sheep and bring them to your farm. And you know, he'll pay you for the hay. And if you could just raise them. And I don't know, one of those days, I just went, all right, whatever, just bring the, bring them over. That's sort of a yes story, you know, like, yeah, let's do this. Even though I said no for years. So this big truck pulls up, these 12 sheep get out. I knew so little about the sheep that I didn't even ask what kind of sheep, which is crazy, (laughs) you know? And, And so they got out, Three, I was getting my master's at the time in counseling psychology that this was happening. So it was really crazy. And three weeks after they showed up, they started having babies. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> I mean, that was really nuts. So I was, um, I had to learn really fast. I learned really fast. And because I called everybody up and anybody that had sheep, I called them up. I said, come on over. I started out by taking photographs of the moms and the babies just to record who belonged to who. Everything I do is with photography. So, I mean, I guess I have to write it down because they all have tags. But no, that one. So I was photographing them. And of course, they're here, so I'm photographing them. And I'm looking at the photographs and I'm like, wow, this is, this is, these are amazing animals. This is, this looks awesome. So I started you know, blowing them up really big. And now I'm in a gallery. And I sell these huge, huge 36 by 36 photographs of sheep. You've seen them, right? You've seen the pictures? Yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah, that's how that happened. Yeah, when, actually, when Jean sent me your website, you know, she's kind of prefaced it like, yeah, she photographs sheep. I'm like, really? That sounds really interesting. So I went and looked at your photos. I'm like, Okay, now I get it. This is this is the real deal. <laughs> this is really good stuff. <laughs> yeah, I just sold one uh, two days ago, which was great. Will in the snow. You know that photograph? It's black and white, and it's snowing. Yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, that photograph I've sold. I'm on uh, the editions are of ten. I don't know why I did that because I've sold <laughs> six of them. The next one's going to be seven ten. Yeah. That's all over the country. Well, there's so many things to unpackage here. I guess, real quick, 
How did you even get into photography to begin with? I mean, you said you've been doing it for 50 years. I'd, I'd love to hear what your story is there. Well, when I was a little kid, somebody gave me a camera, probably my dad or mom or something. So I started to, I look at these pictures that were 1960. So when I was 12 and they look very familiar to me. <laughs> I'm like, oh, there are horses, dogs, animals on the farm. We had a farm in New York. I grew up in New York. And after I had that camera, no one else in the family took any more pictures. It was all just me taking the pictures because I was recording everything. I was just, you know, that was my thing, was to take pictures. And I don't remember as a little kid thinking I wanted to grow up to be a photographer. I didn't have a lot of mentors or other people. You know, women were like stewardesses, you know, housewives, right. secretaries. You know, so I, I wasn't thinking that um, I was just taking pictures. And then I went to school and I studied art because I was also an artist. I painted, I drew. When I was at Silvermine College of Art in New Canaan, Connecticut, John Cohen was my teacher. John Cohen, he was an amazing guy. He was a filmmaker, a photographer and a musician. He was in a band called the New Lost City Ramblers. And he used to mm. go down south. He used to go down to Peru and he was um, filming folk music and trying to preserve the folk music thing. But he was really, he was like my guy, you know? I mean, it's because of him, I think, that, that I continued to do this. And then I went to George Washington University and studied printmaking. Not printmaking like, you know, photography print, but uh, etchings and lithographs and woodcuts and things like that. And then when I got out, I moved to Maine and I just started working for newspapers and taking pictures and taking pictures and just never stopped taking pictures. Yeah. <laughs> that makes makes total sense. So you you actually have a formal art education that I'm sure you've been able to apply to the photographs that you make with, uh, of the sheep. Yeah. I mean, I I I'm very I was listening to somebody on your podcast talk about cropping I don't remember who that was, but they were talking about how important that is. That's, I would say, the main thing. And I do know how to do that, you know, opposed to I don't know a whole lot about Photoshop and about how to do that. But I do know how to crop. And that's, that's very important to me, you know, that to make the photograph, you know, so you're, when your eyeball's going around, it doesn't get stuck in the corner or mm -hmm. fly off this direction. It just keeps going into the center of it and then maybe flow around a little bit. You know, and I, I, I give workshops sometimes. I haven't in a long time, but I used to give a lot of workshops. That's another thing I've learned at your listening to your podcast. A lot of people give workshops. I would say so. Wow. I mean, it is, it is, the, it is the main way that people can make a living at photography nowadays. Super cool. Yeah. I, I want to I wanna come give a workshop. Anyway, so I, I, I would do this a lot in, in my workshops about the cropping. Somebody gives me a photograph, and it's very easy just to go, oh, boop, boop. And they're like, oh, wow, that's better. <laughs> that's way better. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can't remember. I can't remember who said this, but there's a famous quote that says something along the lines of, I've never seen a photograph that couldn't be improved with a, with a crop. And I think it's true. <laughs> wow. I think it's very true. <laughs> You mean the beginning of a photograph, the raw, yeah, like yeah, right I out mean, of the camera? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. If if you get it perfect in your camera, that's a mistake. You you're lucky. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> Although, I guess because those guys with the big, the big, you know, eight by tens or five by sevens, they're probably cropping it in the in the shot, wouldn't you say? Because they're underneath the thing and they're looking for a long time and they're. I would say that. The longer I've been a photographer, the more intentional my compositions are in the field. And I've even gotten to the point where, and I didn't used to do this, but now I'm, I'm able to see the crop in the field. Like, okay, I see how I want to crop this, so I'm going to take it like this and I'm going to crop it later. The trick is remembering that when you get back into Lightroom, you're like, what was I going to do with that photo? <laughs> I think understanding that, you know, composition is probably, I would argue, the 
most overlooked skill set a photographer needs to develop? Everything. Well, besides yeah. the light. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> it's pretty big. Yeah. I mean, you know, in a, if you're a painter, you can paint it that way. You know, right. you, you can like not, I'm photographing the sheep out there and I'm looking at it and it's like, there's a piece of sheep poop or there's a, you know, another sheep that's in the wrong place back there. There's always something. It's always, it's very, and, and I always think, well, if I was a painter and I was painting the scene, I wouldn't, pay, I wouldn't put that in. You right. know, people think, oh, you're a photographer, you just click, click, click. Yeah, you try it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not. It's not as simple as it sounds. No, it's not. No. <laughs> well, cool. So you own a farm, you have a bunch of sheep, and you are creating artwork of the sheep that you're raising. How do you balance the responsibilities of maintaining your farm with the desire to create fine art of the place and its residents? Well, it doesn't take as long to take the pictures as it does to do the farm. <laughs> Shovel so, the poop and, and shovel the feed, hay. And feed them, all. move them. I move them with the dogs, which is one of my really favorite things. I love the dogs um, and the herding. Um, but I, so I'll go out and I'll be doing the work and everything and I'll look at the light in the barn and I'll, oh my gosh. I, and so I'll come in and get my camera and crouch down. And of course, a lot of times the light's gone by the time I do that. Of course. And then sometimes I just bring my camera a lot of times and just put it somewhere that I can't find after I'm done with my chores. But so I have it. But it's it's a combination of those two things, just coming in and getting. Now, if it's snowing, as you probably saw from looking at my photographs, I'm a real fan of the snow and that mm. and that doorway. When it's snowing, if it's snowing, I'll get all bundled up and I'll go out with my camera and specifically to photograph the sheep. So I just do both. Hmm. Take care of them and photograph them. So it sounds to me like your process is a little bit more spontaneous than it is planned from a kind of thinking about how you create the artwork perspective. Well, I don't you know, I don't go because I don't have to go anywhere. So I don't say, oh, on Tuesday, I'm going to go out. Tuesday at three, I'm going to go out and photograph some sheep. I mean, never. I, it's just, it's sort of wrapped up in my life of, you know, the farming and the photographing. And I photograph a lot of other things also, just for my own self, my, my grandkids, my dogs. I think... Not I think, I pretty much know that um, you have to be photographing a lot. I mean, back when I was doing a lot of commercial work, I photographed all the time, even if I didn't have a job, because I wanted to be ready. I mean, photographing a dog, you know, leaping into the water, trying to catch it mid, you know, I mean, photographing, it was like practicing all the time, although I don't think of it as practicing because I love to do it, but you know, if you don't have a job or you're in a slump, I mean, everybody gets in a slump and doesn't pick up their camera, right? <laughs> but but mostly I try to do it a lot so that I don't, you know, it's like playing an instrument. So I don't lose touch with my camera, you know? Yeah, it's one of the things I'm always harping on with students is, even if you don't like the subject or the art or the light or whatever, like it's not optimal or it's not ideal to what you kind of went into the into the particular day with the mindset of, it's still important to practice even if you know you're not gonna keep that photograph and and you never know. Maybe that you maybe maybe you'll find something that you do end up liking or whatever. But like you said, I think practice makes perfect and the more we can get out there with our cameras and kind of continue to hone in that craft, I think, the better. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep keep doing it all the time. Yeah. 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 And, and to your point, it's, it, also, it is also easy to get burned out. Like, I mean, I've, I saw some people on threads talk about like, oh, I take my camera everywhere I go all the time. 
I'm like, not me. <laughs> I don't, I, I like that would be too much for me. But whenever I do trips at all with photography as the kind of the main purpose of the trip, you, you bet that I'm taking a lot of pictures. So, yeah. Yeah. I like to keep it separate though. Like if I go on vacation with just my wife and we're not going anywhere specific for photography, I'll leave all my camera gear at home. You have your phone. Exactly. You can still <laughs> practice with the phone. Right. That's right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I actually, it's taken me until pretty much now to stop taking my camera. Yeah. And I, because whenever I wouldn't take my camera, I think, oh, shoot, I wish I had my camera. But yeah, I don't do it so much anymore. It's like, it's heavy. It's heavy. And it's like, uh, you know, I... All those pictures that, that I was taking for people, like if I go to a concert, my friend's in a band, I'll go to a concert and I'll take pictures of her and I'll send them to her. And I'm like, I'm doing that all the time, taking family pictures of my friends. And I'm like, you know, this is crazy. You know, just because I can do this doesn't mean I have to do it all the time. Right. Yeah. And I've, I've gotten to the point where... I don't really mind if I'm somewhere and something awesome's happening and I don't have my camera. Um, I used to get really bad, like f fear of missing out, you know, FOMO, where I'd be like, oh, I wish I had my camera. And now I'm just like, you know what? Just enjoy it and it's all good, it's, you know? Yeah. You probably weren't going to create a great photograph anyway. Right. So, <laughs> Like you're at the Walmart parking lot and there's a beautiful sunrise. It's like, yeah, no one wants to see a beautiful sunrise over a Walmart, so... In terms of a <laughs> photograph, I mean. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah. It's a good place to get to. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I mean, it's very freeing. You know, you're not yep. constantly thinking about it in that way. But on the other hand, I appreciate it. You know, I remember being super excited about wanting to take my camera everywhere I went. And I get it. But at the same time, I think it's good to get to the point where you don't have to do that anymore. Well, I, and I think you, you're not just getting to a place where you're not bringing your camera. You're getting to a place where you can interact with humans <laughs> instead of <laughs> having this camera in front of you, which is a barrier, really, to real interaction. I mean, you're sort of stepped over in the side and you're photographing what's going on. I mean, that's, I use that a lot as I'm an introvert. So I would, if I had a camera, I would feel that I was, was able to, you know, separate myself from the hubbub. Right. Almost like you're hiding behind the camera, so to exactly. speak. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember uh, when I was in school and I was out in Arizona and I was, I, I, I had my master's in counseling psychology, as do you, I hear. Uh, mine's in very similar, yeah, clinical yeah. psychology, but yeah. um, um, I went to undergrad with, for counseling. Yeah. So this is, uh, the, my concentration was equine-assisted mental health. I did that for a while. But anyway, I'm at a workshop, and I'm photographing the horses, and I'm photographing the people's interaction with the horses, and I'm, you know, and the instructor came over to me, and she said, do you want me to hold your camera? No, 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 I'm, I'm good. And she goes, give me the camera. You know, <laughs> you get in the round pen with the horse. And I was like, oh, okay, busted. Busted. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'll never forget yeah. that. It's really when I realized that I was doing that, just trying mm. to not be involved, just over here taking pictures. It's a good, it's a good shield. Yep, it is. All right, well, let's talk a little more about sheep. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, what? Paint us a picture. What are some of the biggest challenges of being a sheep herder combined as a photographer? A shepherdist is probably yeah, yeah, or sheep. Herder. Um, I didn't use that word because I was like, I probably will butcher that. So. Shepherdist, yeah. So shepherdist. So what would be the challenges? Shepherdist photographer? Yeah. Really, no challenges at all. Matter of fact, it's awesome because I'm photographing the sheep. So I don't, I mean, if I'm trying to birth a lamb or save a lamb's life or put a sheep down or some kind of thing like that. Obviously, I don't have my camera doing that. I wish someone else did because that would make a great movie. <laughs> but mm. um, yeah, when things are when things are all 
copacetic, things are all calm. Or I go out in the morning and the, before I start doing my chores and they're standing by the barn, the light, if you've looked at my photograph, you've seen that barn light coming in and they're standing there. It's like, thank you. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. It's a gift. So, it's a gift. Yeah. It's like, thank you. So like that picture of Will in the snow, you know which one I mean? I think so. Yeah. You've got a couple of pictures of sheep with snow, but I, have I think a, I know I have, which one you're... I have a lot of them. Yeah. It's my favorite <laughs> thing. Um, and he's just in the doorway because I like it to be, I, I, mean, I love when it's all black behind them and, and the snowing and, you know, he was in the doorway and it was just sheep in the doorway. And then he went like this to stretch and he pulled his head in like this. And if, you, if now when you look at the photograph, you'll see that he's doing that because his head's going down this way instead of out this way. I was like, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> that was, I knew, and I don't usually know, but I knew at that moment that this was going to be, you know, one of my faves. Yeah. Well, and when, when we teach wildlife photography, one of the things that we talk a lot about is uh, using gesture, so kind of anticipating when wildlife is going to make some sort of gesture, whether that be a mating ritual or feeding or or really just any type of interesting gesture other than just like bird on a stick or, you know, just standing still. Like you want some kind of interesting gesture. And, I'm you know, and for this is a, this is a perfect example of how gesture just can take an interesting scene and then just make it exceptional. That's exactly what that was. And if you're, you have to be, though, looking through the camera and ready, <laughs> you know, so you have to be. Correct. Yeah, <laughs> you can't, those gestures are very fleeting, you know, so it's not like, oh, I'll give, they, oh, that'd be gone. Can you, can you do that again for me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that, there's a picture I just did. It's called Itty Bitty. It's on my Instagram. It's a big headshot of a, of a sheep and there's a sh bit of white light coming down like this. And that sheep was, and I had my long lens cause I was doing somebody's headshot, a friend of mine. And so I had this, the long lens on, usually I don't, I usually have a shorter lens on there. So I was waiting for her to do something and I just put it towards the sheep and that sheep was in the doorway. And I'm thinking to myself, just move, just move, just move a little bit, just, just a little, and she moved a little bit, and the sun went right down here, and it was like, oh, thank you. Done. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know about you, but I think that's one of the things I love about uh, photography in general is that there's a, there's a lot of anticipation involved, and the better you get at photography, I think there's a direct correlation to kind of experience where you can anticipate when something is about to be good and so you're kind of primed and ready and then when it when that anticip like when acknowledgement of that anticipation um pays off it's very it's very satisfying it really is it is yeah somebody i i was telling that story to somebody about the itty bitty with that piece of light and they said oh you're a wildlife photographer i said no, <laughs> no i'm not but <laughs> but it was like that waiting waiting yeah, I mean, although i didn't wait six similar. hours you know i waited three minutes so <laughs> right but you knew that the possibility existed right right and i was hoping and what's interesting i mean we've covered this topic a million times but what's interesting in my mind is hearing you talk about that moment it, you know you could have you could create a moment like that using photoshop right like you could well, add that not light. me but somebody could <laughs> but you, a person could yes. right like yes. you could <laughs> You could take a fairly low contrast photograph of a sheep and then you could kind of, you know, dodge and burn and add that light just the exact same way you photographed it. And, you know, you'd have a very similar effect. Um, it'd be a piece of art. But what is missing from that is as the creator uh, of that piece of art, um, it no longer represents something that you anticipated and that almost there's like a little bit of luck involved and that, that piece of satisfaction that you get from kind of completing that circle of anticipating 
seeing the possibility and then capturing the moment. And I think that's the part of that whole argument that I find myself falling into is like, you can do whatever you want in Photoshop, but like you're, you've disconnected yourself from kind of that experiential piece of photography. Yeah, I mean, do you think that, I mean, you understand that, I understand that, it's pretty clear, but does the viewer understand that? I mean, do you think, I should hope so, but do you think that that photograph I took of Itty Bitty has got this, some soul in it or it's got some emotion in it that I want to portray that it wouldn't have if somebody really good at Photoshop did that? Yeah, it's interesting, right? I just read a really interesting article about this and he kind of coined the phrase photographic illusion and I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but essentially what his argument was is that most people, when we look at photographs, we hold this belief, which we're, we can call the photographic illusion, that that photograph represents something that the photographer actually was able to witness. Again, that's an illusion because it can be created in other means outside of the photographic process. Uh, but I think what separates photography as an art form from other art forms is that it is based on capturing a actual moment in time. And I think that's what a lot of people who are viewing photography like about it as well. They, they kind of like that it represents or has the illusion that it represents something that was actually witnessed. And I think for most people, not all, but for a lot of people, when they see an image, they assume that it was something that the photographer actually witnessed. And when they learn that it was actually just created in Photoshop or whatever, I think there's it's kind of a letdown for a lot of people. It's like, oh, really? You know, it's like... Not fair. Man. Yeah. Well, it's not like fair, but it's just like, oh, I, you know, I, I assume that was... I assumed what I was watching here was a, a documentary about this really cool moment. And what you're telling me is that it actually didn't happen. And that's kind of a letdown. Yeah, I would think so. But that's not yeah. to say that something you can create in Photoshop isn't art, art as well. It's just that it loses some of that impact, I think, when you realize that it actually isn't something the photographer was able to witness themselves. I, mean, you know. I would think that if I knew how to do that kind of thing in Photoshop, that, I mean, I'm ADD, so I can hyper-focus like you wouldn't believe. So I could hyper-focus in front of a, a, a image in Photoshop. And if I knew how to do that, I mean, when do you stop, you know? Yeah, that'd be too hard. I mean, that would be too, I would just rather get out my pen and draw something and paint paint something. I mean, I will, right. I will take out, I can, I can take out things, you know, though that big picture of itty bitty, I, when I had it framed, I was taking it over to the gallery and I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh man, there's some boogers coming out of her nose. I didn't see that. I, how could I not have seen that? I would have definitely gotten rid of the boogers, but people are saying that. Nah, no one will ever notice. I'm like, well, I just noticed, so probably shouldn't have said that. But but they're there, right? Yeah, they are um, there. It was real life. No, so. it's, no it's interesting because what I find when I talk to people about this, I find that a lot of it's rooted in kind of how you value the experience side of capturing photographs. Like whenever I look at a lot of my favorite photographs, it takes me right back to that moment and what was happening around me, the sights, the smells, the sounds, how I was feeling, um, what the landscape or the scene was doing to me as a person. And I find that when you create something uh, that isn't based on an experience in Photoshop or whatever, like that experiential side is completely removed. And then at least for me personally, because I value that experience side so much, I it's really hard for me to connect with that creation from from my perspective like it, it just doesn't connect anymore because i know that it's it was just created like i i want i i really value that experiential side of the photographic process yeah. can you do you know how to do can you like make whole things out of photoshop 
Do you know how to do that? Yeah. You do? It's not, yeah. Not I mean, art. <laughs> well, the hard part is to make it, making it look realistic. Real. When, when that first happened, Photoshop, so Photoshop happened before the digital cameras. So, I mean, yes. the computers and all that. So I was working for Beans at the time, doing the Beans catalog. I did that for years. And Land's End and Dover Saddlery. And that was, a, that was a big part of my business was catalog work. And when the thought of a digital situation came up, it seemed like, oh, wow, that's, that's going to be really cool. <laughs> that's going to be better. And Kodak and Apple got together and um, opened up this center in Camden, Maine, of all places, where you could go and learn and work on computers and learn Photoshop. So I went up there. For weeks, I went up there. And my mother lived up there, so it was great. I could stay with her. And I remember they had a the first digital camera prototype thing. It was this huge thing with a little tiny screen kind of at your hip and this great big thing. And you, this was in the 90s, and you take a picture and then you look and tell. But we were all like, wow, that's amazing. You know? So I really wanted to learn how to do this. I thought this was incredible. Never really did. I mean, it never really learned it the way a lot of people know it now. I mean, enough so that I can open up in it and crop and shadows and get rid of sheep poop. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm I get that. I do want to leverage the experience that you come to the table with. So, like you said earlier, you've been photographing professionally for like over 50 years. So, I find here we have like an this amazing opp- opportunity to kind of tap into all of that wisdom that you bring. How has your approach to making images uh changed since you first started and maybe uh tell us a little bit about kind of what that journey has looked like for you in terms of what you used to do and kind of what you do today. You know how little kids can paint so well, you know, like people will look at an abstract photograph. It's an old joke where they say, oh, my five-year-old can do that. And I said, yeah, but can you? No, you can't. Your five-year-old can. Because when you're, when you're not thinking about it, when you're not overthinking it, you're just, creativity is better. You know, it flows better than you So when I look at photographs that I was taking back in the beginning, I really, you know, I, I, I like looking at them and I, I see some that I was like, oh man, I, if I would, I'm very proud of that photograph. So now my, as far as artwork and like my sheep go compared to before, I mean, for, for years I worked for newspapers. I was actually the first woman photographer at the Portland Press Herald. And the first woman photographer at L.L. Bean. <laughs> so, this, so when you're working for a newspaper or you're working for a, a catalog company, you, you're being told what to do. You know, you're being, and like if it was a really good newspaper, a big city newspaper, you might have a creativity and there's some really great newspaper photographers. But I was pretty much reined in all the, all the time. And I remember I, someone had been, a family had been burned out. It was Christmas, and I had to go to the hotel where they were, and I took pictures of the family. I think the Red Cross had put them up, and it was Christmas Eve, and it was like 10 o'clock at night, and I just wanted to go home, you know? And I'm in the dark room, and I'm making these prints, and I went over and I put them on the editor's desk, and I was getting my coat on to go out, and she comes in. She goes, oh, this is no good. And I'm like, why not? She said, well, they don't look sad enough. I'm like, well, you know, they're happy that the Red Cross put them up. You know? I mean, luckily I went through my, my whole role and had some really sad looking pictures. Then I just remember thinking, I, this, is, this is not for me. Although it was a job, you know, uh, if you get a job taking pictures, that's pretty good. You know, I used to always think, well, I have a camera, so I might as well do whatever there is to do. But even though when I was doing those things as a job, I was always taking pictures of things just for my own self, you know, just pictures of this and that, this and that. But until it got to the sheep, I really 
wasn't ever honed in on one thing. I used to love street photography. I'd go down to New York and just spend days and days walking the street, taking pictures of everything in the subway and everything. I love that. The, the sheep have begun, become such a challenge. So to take a better picture than Will in the Snow, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so being, being honed in on one thing is the difference than before, than just taking pictures of whatever you wanted to take pictures of. Or I like street photography. I like the humans out there, you know, and being able to stop that and being able to look at it. You know, and, oh, that, that's something that went by so fast. You know, that was out there in the street. And people are walking around. That's going by so fast. But I just stopped it. And look at that person's face. And look at that guy eating a pizza. And look at, you know, I love that. I love the, the, the show you had on with that street photographer. That was cool. Yeah, Kamal. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. As you were talking, I couldn't help myself. For whatever reason, my brain went back to what we were talking about before because you said your editor wanted you wanted to show the picture of them being sad, even though they were happy. And it just goes to show you, even in photojournalism, photography is not reality, right? Like, because you chose to show use the picture where the people looked sad, you actually were doing a sort of a little bit of a disservice to what was really happening in that they were actually happy. So I think it just goes to show, like, photography isn't reality um, at all. It's it's how the photographer ch chooses to show, what the photographer chooses to show the viewer, by what, what they're excluding in the frame, what focal length they're using, what aperture they choose, what shutter speed they choose. Those are all abstractions of reality. And so when people say, well, that photo is not real, I'm always like, eh, photos aren't reality. They're just like slices of what the photographer wants to show you. So anyway, yes. not to go back to that subject, but it, it really reminded me that even in photojournalism, photography is not reality. Well, it's a, it's a tiny window into exactly. whatever's going on. I mean, there's su stuff going on, like the when I was doing the catalog stuff, um, the on-figure fashion, I mean, it's this beautiful, you're on the beach, and it's all beautiful, and da, 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 but right outside of it, right outside of it, great big scrims, great big fills, people running around, da, blah, blah, you know, just a tiny little sliver. It's the same with the sheep. I mean, you don't see, I, I want to portray how I feel a lot of the time when I'm out there. And, and I can only feel that because I live it. You know, somebody said I had a show in May, 10 36 by 36 images. It was cool. It was really great. And a lot of people showed up. It was like, ah, really fun. <laughs> and somebody said, where are the sheep? I'm like, where do you go to photograph the sheep? And I said, outside my door. I mean, this is, I raise these sheep. And they were like, oh, my God, you raise the sheep? <laughs> I said, yeah. And they were like, oh, no wonder, you know, because you couldn't just show up at a sheep farm and, and do this. I've said, people come here and try, which, oh, kind of, oh, but anyway, that's another, that's a whole nother thing. So I like my pictures. I mean, the black and white ones, the color ones are obviously color, which couldn't be a hundred years ago, really. I don't know when color came in, but I like the feel of timelessness, you know, that it was because sheep have been around for a long time, a really long time. And I just, the old barn, you know, my barn's 200 years old. And the sheep and the window and the light coming in. But, you know, outside of that are lambs being need to save, sheep getting sick. I mean, I think that's what we do as photographers is hone it into something beautiful, you know, calming. Because we're all out there in, this, in the world with all this input coming at us and stuff coming at us. And, you know, uh, somebody asked me once, what do you want people to feel when they look at your photographs? And uh, I said, I just want them to be, feel peace. I want them to calm down and feel like it's going to be okay. And what's awesome about photography and what you just talked about is that 
it's different for every person looking at it too, right? Because wrapped up in a f- really cool photograph of a sheep in a barn with snow, you, like you would use some words like timelessness and, you know, other words and concepts come into my mind like pastoralism and the story of the American farmer. And I mean, there's all kinds of narratives that get woven into a single frame of some sheep and snow, right? So the person looking at it's going to interpret it or place their own kind of story around an image. And that's one of the other things I love about photography is that it has the power to do that for the viewer. Yep. And then the people, the Bible people, the lambs, you know, they really... Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even realize that. Someone said, oh, you know, Jesus, lambs. So I'm like, oh, cool. You're like, that's good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. If that's what you need right now. I got it. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I mean, an atheist is going to look at it from through a completely different lens. Right. <laughs> right. Which is yeah. all good. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to talk to you more about, you've done such a wonderful job of specializing in these in this niche. And I know it hasn't necessarily been your intent to be like the sheep photographer, right? Um, but I'm curious what advice you might have for other photographers who are looking to kind of tap in to their own creative niche. I think that you need to s- look close to home. And and if if you're a photographer, then you're a photographer and you have a camera and you love taking pictures. And you don't, I mean, I would love to be traveling the world too and, and uh, <laughs> all the places you go. And, and I used to do that a lot for the... Um, equestrian thing that that was really cool and I would go to all these different countries and photograph these different horses and photograph the the hunt the hunt and the guys in the hunt and their dogs and that was that was great but it wasn't like and people would say oh Nina's so lucky she gets to go you know how people think it's luck (laughs) I'm next week I'm going to be 76 years old and I photograph very close to home I sometimes think about going on another equestrian vacation, but I went on one two years ago, which was great. But my advice would be that it really is that there's, there's art and there's what you love all around you, all around you. So don't be thinking, oh, I wish I was that guy. I wish I could do that. I, if I was that guy, or if I had a big one, if I had money, like if I had more money, I'd be able to be a better photographer because I'd be able to go on trips or I'd be able to buy a better lens. I mean, that we all suffer from that, you know, and wonder how, how's that guy doing it? You know, how's that guy doing that? How'd he do that? Oh, he must, he must have inherited money or something, you know, you don't, you don't have to have all that. You're, you're creative, you're a photographer. And if you, if it, that's something that you like, that's something that you love, then, then you are a photographer and then just go out. You don't, don't be mad that you're not traveling around the world. Just, you know, photograph something nearby. Yeah. And not to like simplify it, but what I heard you just say is like spend some time self-reflecting on things that bring you joy closer to home. Yep. And you're probably going to land on a niche that not only differentiates you from other photographers, but has the wonderful benefit of providing you with joy and passion and fulfilling you as an artist. And that's going to come through in the work that you create. I guarantee that. Yep. That's true. Yep. I yeah. mean, the... the uh... You go out in the garden, and, and if you live in a city, you're going around, there's flowers everywhere, trees, and you look inside that flower, and you look, at, you know, it's like, wow, there's, there's a lot going on in there. You know, there's stuff everywhere. There's beautiful stuff everywhere. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's talk about uh, your gallery representation, because you had mentioned you had a really awesome gallery show, and you've got some pieces in a gallery, so tell us. Uh, what you got going on with gallery representation? So I'm with uh, the Portland Art Gallery in in Portland, Maine, and they how I got in there. I don't know when this was 2017, 2018. I was 
photographing so many sheep. And so I thought, wouldn't it be cool to go all over the state? Because I've written a lot of travel articles about horses. So I thought I could write an article about sheep, about other sheep farmers in the state. And because I wanted to f just photograph sheep. <laughs> so I called up Down East Magazine. That's a magazine here in Maine. And yeah. I said, well, I'm a photographer and I photograph sheep. And I, I'm a writer and I'm going to, you know, blah, 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 do this article. So the guy goes, okay, I'll get back to you. And he gets back to me and he says, oh, you know, we looked at your website and your photographs of sheep. We would just like to do a story on you and your sheep photographs. I'm like, oh, that's way better. That's perfect. <laughs> so they did that. And so that was going to come out in October. And this is what I like to do. I used to do it when I was doing the catalog work. Is It's like, okay, I'm going on a horseback ride. Give me some clothes. I'll put them on somebody. I'll take photographs of, you know, I like to add add-ons as much as I can to what I'm doing. You know, I'm going on a, I'm going on a walk in, to Ireland. Give me a bunch of clothes. I'll put them on the guide and I'll photograph them for your catalog. And then I'll make like money doing this and make money doing that. So I, I went around to galleries. Actually, this was only the second gallery I went into. And I said, I'm having this article come out about me and my sheep photographs in Down East Magazine. And if I can have a show here, we'll put it in the I'll have them put that in there at the end of the article, like show Nina's blah, 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 go see, you know. And they were like, yeah, cool. So that's how I got in. That's genius. Which, <laughs> if I look back on it, yeah, it was. <laughs> but I, <laughs> but I um, you know, and I'm the only photographer. There's like 63 painters in that gallery, and I'm the only photographer. I was wondering, oh, wow. why, why do they... Why do they have that? But, you know, they're these big, they do, and, they, and they're good at, they're really good at um, social media, and they came out here in the beginning and did a little movie. It's really great. It's like eight minutes long of me and the sheep, and I think it's on the gallery website, and they have podcasts, and they, have, they do. So, I mean, you give them a lot of the money, half of it, but... It's sort of a, what's the word? You know, like, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, um, it's kind of a big deal was, to be in the gallery. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I was going to say, like, it definitely feeds the ego. <laughs> it feeds the ego and it feeds the it's, other people thinking, oh, you must really be, a, you must be something if you're in that gallery. It's like, eh, yeah, I was gonna say, it's still like me. Kind of validate, it's validating, Valid that's the right? Word. That's the word, yeah. Right? Like, yeah, I actually am kind of awesome at this. <laughs> I'm, you know, you... I guess, because I'm in a gallery, so... <laughs> people are buying the pictures. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, you know, I, there was a gallery in um, Mid-Coast that wanted me to show, and there's a um, part of the contract is 60 miles from the gallery to showing, and this was 75, but the gallery was like, oh, you can do that, but we wouldn't be that happy about that. Mm -hmm. So I decided not to. I mean, I could have. That was a, I talked to a lot of people about that. You know, that was a decision I had to make. But in another state, you know, I'd really like to get, I mean, who wouldn't want to be in a gallery in New York or Boston or Denver? Right. I'm curious, what advice would you have for people who might be thinking to themselves like, that sounds awesome. Like, how, how do you, where would you even start? Well, I've asked the gallery that um, because I'm like, how do you, what do you not like? You know, like, what do you, what turns you off about people? Because they get a lot of people wanting to be, you know, and they said somebody walks in with their phone and goes, here, I'm a, you know, I'm a painter or I'm a photographer. Or, I'm a, it's on here, you know, instead of a, you know, website that's really nice, you know, they're not going to look at something on, on your phone. Although, the first gallery that I was in in Maine was in Wiscasset, and I had made a great big, this was, I think, 2017 or 18, and I had made a huge print of a sheep and her lamb, and then I had a guy do the frame, a uh, guy I knew who was doing frames at a barn board. It was really cool, and it was huge. And I went into this gallery in Wiscasset because my cousin 
was in this gallery. So she knew the lady. And I said, oh, I'm a photographer. And she said, no, we don't do photographs. They just did oil paintings of a lot of main stuff. And I did have my phone. I did say, well, look at this. And she was like, oh, my gosh, that's huge. That's big. You know, that's impressive. So we had a show there, which is what started hmm. the whole thing. So I did that and it worked. But, you know, I have written to a lot of galleries in other states. I have never once heard back. Like you could just say, no, you know, you suck or it's not what we do or it's not what we want. But they don't. I mean, they don't, mm -hmm. they don't, they don't write you back. I mean, they probably have, you know, thousands of people trying to. So I guess my advice would be to start in your hometown, you know, where you can go in and you can talk to the person or you can, you know, if, if they don't have a gallery in your hometown, then you start one. I, <laughs> I started a gallery in the seventies in Portland. It was the first photography gallery. And, uh, I had, a, it was, I had a studio, and so we had a studio slash gallery, and we used to change up, and we used to have shows, and, and we did that, but yeah. Yeah, as you were talking, I remember that I actually have been in our local arts gallery here. Actually, recently, I was the artist of the month. I completely spaced that out for some reason, but I don't even know how that happened. Like, they just, I, I was in one of their kind of like, they do these like, that's Durango. They like, that's the name of the show. Like, you know, and you can pay like $40. And if you get in, they'll ask you to bring in like three pieces of art or whatever. And I got in one of those. And then after that was done, they reached out to me and they asked me if I wanted to be, if I was, they, they wanted to feature me as the artist of the month and if I could bring in a bunch of stuff. Um, and I did that. I think that was back in May, but I don't, I think starting local is really good advice. I think the very first art gallery I was in was in Manatee Springs in color near Colorado Springs and where I grew up and where I was originally from. And I did the same thing. I walked into the gallery and I was like, Hey, how do I, I would like to show my work here. How does that work? And that was back in like 2012. <laughs> it's way different now. Um, but yeah, yeah, I've always heard from kind of aspiring photographers that they would love to be in a gallery. And I don't know, it, to me, I've always felt like, it's not necessarily worth it in terms of like a financial investment because you end up printing a bunch of stuff. It costs you like thousands of dollars and then you hope it sells, right? Yeah. And then if it doesn't sell, you're either stuck with a bunch of stuff or you have to figure out a way to sell it yourself. And so I think it is a risky proposition unless you're careful. Yeah. It, but it, at the same time, yeah, go ahead. It's expensive, but you like, I just had this show, so I had to, make all these prints but most of the stuff is just on their website so if somebody wants to buy something from me from them me us they'll say oh you know could you print that up and frame it yeah okay because i'm gonna buy it that's that's a better way yeah. <laughs> you know unless you're gonna no have doubt. a show and the shows are only once every like three years because there's so many people every every month they change the show and there's like three people so, yeah, but but people buy stuff from websites, and they, they'll go to the gallery website. And, you know, there are, this Portland, Maine, it's very busy in the summer. People are coming in and, you know, plus there's, like, the, pers the, the person that bought Will in the Snow a couple of days ago was from here. And I had that print because I'd had the show. But if I didn't have it, she would have just seen it on the website and said, could you print that? That's a right. much better way of doing it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, all of my print sales now, I'm, it's all through my website. So it is definitely the way to go. But then you, there's all other problem of actually getting people to the website to begin with. But that's the nice thing about a gallery is that you have foot traffic of real people who walk in and they're interested in art. And then they, and then they can direct them to a website where they can buy prints. So I think that that makes a lot of sense if you can find a gallery that does that. Yeah. Like you just said, if it's not, I mean, if you have a, an image on the wall in a gallery, then it's like sort of automatically art, you know, or fine art. But your mindset has to be that it is anyway, that what you're doing is art. 
I can remember the first time I was a teenager and I was going down to Nevis and I was on a plane and you know how they give you the thing to fill out and it says occupation. And I remember writing photographer and thinking, well, not really. I mean, you know, teenager. <laughs> but I remember looking at it and thinking, yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to write. That's, does that make me a photographer? Because I just wrote that down on this visa thing. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to be an art photographer. But for most of my career, like all of it, I had to do commercial work, you know, and I had shows now and again around, but that was, it was scattered stuff, you mm -hmm. know, it was this and it was that, it was, you know, horses and maybe some pretty dew drops on something. And I always, I always was very serious about it and really loved it. And then when I got up there, like I, I listening to your podcast, you know, it's been really great because I, and listening to your podcast and listening to all these different photographers, it's like, oh, yeah, wow, I have, I have a group here. Because I'm very sort of isolated out in the country and I don't have other friends really that are photographers. So one reason why I love your podcast, because people say stuff and it's like, oh, yeah, that's, I feel that way too, <laughs> you know, <laughs> about, so you get it. I think somebody said recently that you put it up on the wall and then you think, maybe it was you, and then you think, why did I do that? What? That sucks. Why am I All doing that? All the time. That? Yeah. <laughs> All the like, time. Like, oh, geez. And that just cost me a fortune. And now I, oh, yikes. Um, and, you know, you can be a photographer and everybody knows you're a photographer and that's what you do. But then once you put it all out there, it's really, you know, the emperor with no clothes on. Yeah, it's like, it's got to be, you got to like it because now that, that image is going to be until you have your next show. Yeah, and there's something liberating about that, too. It's like you're done for now, and then, oh, yeah, whoops, I missed that flaw, or uh, I should have edited that differently or whatever, but at the same time, it's like you've completed the process of creating art um, because there's this phys physical, tangible object that you can touch and feel and hold and look at it from different angles and get close and get far away, and and there's something really awesome about that feeling once you have that f finished product in your hands and it's on the wall it's very i don't know it's very satisfying <laughs> yeah i felt i felt pretty good about the last show yeah i bet <laughs> yeah yeah all right well last question okay who do you recommend for the podcast i'm going to recommend my friend whitney leg who's a documentary filmmaker and a photographer and nancy brown who is I studied with in New York back in the 80s as, as an assistant. I worked with her. She's amazing. She's 85 and she's still photographing. She's doing a, she did a book on China. She's now doing a book on India and she's going over there for her like ninth time to take photographs. I mean, I was just like, okay, that's very inspiring. And Gina Danza. So Gina, it's wild Gina on Instagram. And so look her up. And Whitney is Whitney.leg. I don't think Nancy has Instagram. She, she's like, no. But yeah, those three people. And, and Wild Gina happens to be a landscape photographer. So there you go. Yeah. Love yeah. it. Yeah. Well, Nina, this has been super fun. I really love looking at your photographs and I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. This has been really fun. We could have talked forever. I know, I know. <laughs> Well, thank you to Nina for joining me on the podcast this week. I had a blast. Nina also happened to recently begin supporting the podcast over on Patreon, along with Carl Zimmerman and a kind soul named Yvonne. Patreon is the best way to support the podcast financially. So thank you to everyone who has done so. If you too would like to support me and this podcast, please visit patreon.com forward slash f stop and listen that's patreon.com forward slash f stop and listen or find a link in the show notes i look forward to engaging with each and every one of you in the show note releases that happens every single week on patreon you can check it out for free 
See you there. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.